mistakes were made. Do you know? Reasonable doubt number 10. I'm going to give you a hypothetical. And I want you to give me an honest answer as to whether the state has disproven this sequence of events. November 21st, 2015, Conrad Sipa goes to his friend Richard Duty's house. We know this because Virginia Murray testified that she received a text message saying that he was going down. We know this because Conrad Sipa buys alcohol for 244. There's a receipt. And we know this because of the traffic. Right? He goes to the house. We know that he drinks because of the toxicology. We know that he drinks to excess. We also know what Richard Duty can be like when he drinks. <coughs> At some point, he becomes highly intoxicated. He becomes aggressive. He becomes violent. In his house, in his kitchen, with his knife, his DNA on the night. He attacks Conrad Sifa. Conrad Sifa runs for the exit. He's struck in the back of the head. They struggle, and ultimately the struggle falls into the chair. Because there's a bag in the chair, as Ms. Johnson pointed out, people would take the bag out before they sit down in the chair. Judy has the knife. His DNA. They are struggling over the knife. Left hand causes injury. Mr. Sipa reaches for the only thing there. A lamp. A lamp is not what you grab when you want to murder someone. The lamp is what you grab when you're grabbing anything you can get your hands on. Struggling over the knife, grabs the lamp, hits Mr. Duty repeatedly, over and over and over. He's not stopping. The lamp's not working, and what Ms. Johnson describes as a weapon failure occurs. It's not doing the job. At that point, the struggle becomes over the knife. The knife is in between them. Mr. Duty holding it. Conrad Sipa struggling with his hand. The knife goes back. The knife goes forth. Goes forth, causing pump tape wounds, and eventually killing Mr. Duty during the struggle. That's self-defense. Conrad Sifa was faced with deadly force from a highly intoxicated person who was not stopped. And he defended himself. Can any of you with a straight face say that the state has disproven that particular sequence of events? By the way, that's one. There's dozens of different scenarios that could have occurred. The stakes are too high for guesswork, speculation, and conjecture. That is a reasonable doubt. They are all reasonable doubts because they're based in the evidence. And at the end of the day, what was Conrad Sipa supposed to do? Tell me what he was supposed to do. Richard Duty is attacking him with a knife. Is he supposed to stand there and worry about how it's going to look to a jury? Is he supposed to stand there and get stabbed to death so that he's not on trial for murder and instead Richard Duty standing over there at that table? Because those were his options. Those were his only two options. There was no third choice. I'm sorry, there wasn't. Had they proved
proven to you beyond any reasonable doubt that Comrade Sita is guilty? Of course not. He has no motive. The forensic evidence, the DNA on the knife handle. John Garkowski, John Garkowski concedes, I don't know if Richard Duty was holding a knife during a struggle. One of them was walking out of the house that night, and the other one wasn't. That's what happened. Richard Duty's blood alcohol content, 0.252. Richard Duty, belligerent when drunk, not someone to be around. Physical evidence, bruising to Richard Duty's arm, bruising on Richard Duty's knuckles, no injury to the back of Richard Duty, no examination of the back of Conrad Seaman's head. And while we're talking about the lamp, let me go back a minute. Conrad Sipa is the cold-blooded murderer. He's the guy who goes down there with murder in his heart, death on his mind, I'm gonna kill my best friend. For no apparent reason, the occupational therapist just wakes up one day and decides to do this. He's walking into the house, two knives in Richard Judy's truck. One knife right below the porch. Kitchen sink full of knives. Knife on the table. And there's a knife right on the coffee table, right by the struggle. He passes all of them, and instead, it's the lamp. Does that make sense that it's murder? Let's go back. Do I believe beyond a reasonable doubt that Conrad Sipa was acting in self-defense? And I would submit to you that on close examination of this evidence, you could come to that conclusion. But even if you don't, even if you came to, it's highly likely he was acting in self-defense. Even if you came to, I think it's likely he's acting in self-defense. Even if you came to, I don't know. I throw my hands up. I don't know what happened that night. The evidence points in both directions, I can't call it, then it's not guilty. <laughs> Is it possible he was not acting in self-defense? Not guilty. I think it's highly probable that Conrad Sipa was not acting in self-defense. I think it's highly probable he's guilty. Still not guilty. The only way you can get there is beyond a reasonable doubt. He was not acting in self-defense. That's the only way you get to a guilty verdict. And I'm sorry, that's not an honest verdict. It's not. There's too much doubt here. Why is there too much doubt? Because he was acting in self-defense. If he wasn't, these doubts wouldn't be here. I'm asking you to do exactly what you promised us. Follow the law, follow the evidence, follow the facts. <coughs> Gruesome pictures are not proof of murder. They're just proof of death. Those are not the same thing. Passion is not proof. Emotion is not evidence. A guilty verdict would only be based on you guessing or speculating. That is exactly what the judge is going to tell you not to do. If you follow the law, then the verdict is not guilty. He is presumed innocent, and that follows him into the jury room. Remember what I said. When you sit down, your starting point is Conrad Sipa is not guilty. Conrad Sipa is acting in self-defense. Have they produced to you evidence that is concrete, compelling, and so persuasive that it moves you all the way to the other end of the spectrum. And I would submit to you that that's just impossible in this case. It is okay to feel sympathy. It is not okay to guess. It is not okay to say, well, somebody's dead, so somebody has to be guilty of murder. The judge is never going to tell you. Your verdict has weight.
and there are no take backs. Whatever you decide, you cannot come back a day from now, a week from now, a month from now, and say, you know what? I think I got it wrong. It's too late. I know you will take this seriously. You know, every, uh, every couple of years, there's this debate whether we're doing this the right way, whether we should have professional jurors instead of citizens, people who are experienced in being a juror, trained, and they're going to sit and listen to cases, and that's their job. And, you know, if you ask, if you ask 10 different lawyers, you're going to get 10 different answers on what they think. For whatever it's worth, this is the way we should do it. And the reason this is the way we should do it is because this is your criminal justice system. This is our criminal justice system. It's run by people. It's the same criminal justice system that everybody enters into if they are accused of crime. And people can say, I don't break the law. I don't do anything illegal. I don't need to worry about this. And they can mean it. And they can be sincere and genuine. But what nobody can say is I won't be accused of breaking the law. And once somebody enters the criminal justice system, this is the system they enter into. There are not two criminal justice systems, one for people who are innocent and one for people who are guilty. I don't get to stand up after Ms. O'Neill gives her closing summation. So at this point, I want to say thank you again. Look. I am leaving Conrad Seafit in your hands. I am asking you to do nothing more, nothing less than what you promised. Be a fair, partial juror, render a decision that's not based on emotion, that's based on the evidence, and based on the facts. 